December the 7th, 1941, a date that shall live in infamy. That was how President Franklin D. Roosevelt broke the news that the American naval base of Pearl Harbor had been attacked by Imperial Japan. If the bullet fired by Gavrilo Princip, which started World War I, was the bullet heard around the world, then today we'll be looking at the high-pitched roar that was heard around the world. Today we'll look at the first bomber to attack American troops in World War II, the bomber that led the charge into Pearl Harbor, and that which would sink more Allied ships than any other Axis plane in the war. Today's mega project is the Aichi Type 99 carrier bomber, or as it would later come to be known, the VAL. The development of the VAL began in 1936 after a call by the Imperial Japanese Navy IJN, for a carrier-based strike bomber to replace the aging Aichi D-1A biplanes. In response, three companies put blueprints forward – Aichi, Nakayama, and Mitsubishi, with the former two being approved to produce prototypes. Even from this early period, though, we know that the VAL was designed with one purpose in mind – the expansion of the Empire of the Rising Sun. While designing the prototype, Aichi took the lead from the German Heikel HE-70 and decided to place the wings fairly low on the aircraft. This was designed to increase the drag, as contrary to most fighter aircraft, a decreased speed could help a dedicated strike bomber by giving them extra time to line up their targets. This ability to fly at exceedingly slow speeds is what made the VAL such a deadly dive bomber in the latter years of the war. However, this design decision did cause many issues. When the first prototype was finally airworthy in 1937, the first tests were continued continuously disappointing. The VAL consistently underperformed in its turning ratio and basic cruising speeds. In designing the bomber, Aichi had aimed to make the VAL slow, but in aerial terms, it was moving at the pace of a snail, and that had to change. The first change made to the design was an improvement of the engine. Gone was the 709 horsepower Nakajima Hikari 9 cylinder, and in was the 839 horsepower Mitsubishi Kensai 14 cylinder engine. This both improved the speed of the aircraft, but also led to the designers feeling that they had reached a better overall fuel economy when the aircraft's new top speed was considered. A second key advantage with the engine change was that the VAL could still move at exceedingly slow speeds if the pilot chose, but it could also also now move at blistering speeds when required, such as when in a dive. This was vital, as much of the power that allowed the bombs to punch their way through a ship's deck actually came from the speed of the aircraft carrying the bomb when it was released. The second change was made to the overall body of the aircraft. The engine cowling was redesigned to fit the new engine, and there were changes made to the tail and the wings in order to give the VAL better directional stability, although pilots throughout the war would complain that it always felt like there was a third crewman in the VAL. That was the wind. These changes ultimately allowed the VAL to seize the coveted place as the Navy's strike bomber of choice from the Nakajima D3N and a cruise speed 100 miles an hour faster than the D3N at the cost of a marginally reduced strike range. This would come back to haunt the Navy, though, as the Americans would show the advantage of the increased strike range through their dauntless dive bomber, which was more expensive than the VAL, but managed to combine the range of the D3N with the speed of the VAL to deadly effect. For now, it didn't matter. Aichi had won the bid, and over the next two years, 479 D3A1s were produced, primarily used in China. The Navy would be so impressed with their performance that in 1942, they would commission an upgraded model of the VAL, specifically designed to have a longer range to allow for strikes against the American Solomon Islands. In total, a further 1,016 D3A2s would be produced before the end of the war. Before covering the operational details of the VAL, firstly, it's important to note one key tactical difference between it and its American counterparts. In the United States Air Force, USAF, the pilot of a dive bomber was also the commanding officer, generally meaning that the second crewman could focus on other tasks such as reconnaissance or manning the rear-mounted machine gun. The IJN instead made the rear-mounted co-pilot the commanding officer, the hope being that this meant the primary pilot could focus on lining up the bombing runs rather than thinking about broader matters like coordinating wingmen. This is a tactic that would serve the IJN well in the early years of the war when they enjoyed practical air domination in China, but it would soon come unraveled when 
facing the United States and her Air Force. The primary reason for this was where the observer sat in relation to the pilot. The pilot enjoyed some protection from the little armor the Val had, whereas the commander had practically no armor around them at all. This led to many situations where the commander of an IGN dive bomber attack would be slain in the attack. This would be just one of the contributing factors that would lead to a so-called brain drain at the latter end of the war, when the IGN and Imperial Japanese Air Force would more or less run out of experienced commanders. Despite that, the D3A1 would see great success in its earliest combat usage in November 1939, one month prior to its formal acceptance by the IGN. The D3A1 would feature prominently in Japanese campaigns in French Indochina, appearing at the key battles of Nanning, Yichan, Chongqing, and Chongqing, which were aimed at cutting off the supply lines to the Chinese Revolutionary Army. Usage of the D3A1 is often cited by historians as a key factor in Japan being able to bring this theater of war to a close by October 1940. From there, the D3A1 would primarily be based out of Hanoi, flying missions against Kunming and the lands that would later come to be known as the Burma Road. It would also be in 1940 that the D3A1 would commence carrier qualification trials, ultimately leading to the D3A1 shifting to an almost entirely carrier-based aircraft by 1942. Ultimately, the D3A1's greatest achievement would come in Pearl Harbor and the 10 months preceding from that surprise attack, where it would feature in every major carrier operation of that time, ultimately with the largest loss of life caused in 1942 when the D-3A1s would launch the Indian Ocean raid against the Royal Navy. This raid would lead to the sinking of the light carrier HMS Hermes, the heavy cruisers Dorset, Shear, and Cornwall, as well as over 25 other ships, which would lead to the deaths of 825 servicemen. Despite what the Allies must have been thinking, Thinking, though, the success of the raid against the Royal Navy was mostly an accident. The D-3A1s involved were equipped with bombs for a land attack rather than the generally lighter naval bombs designed to be easier to maneuver with. This resulted in the bombs used punching through the deck of the Hermes and the heavy cruisers and exploding below the deck, which both maximized the damage to the ship and personnel losses. From that moment onwards, the battlefield doctrine regarding the roll and loadout of D-3A1s would shift. It was discovered that the Val could maneuver just as well with heavy bombs bombs as it could with light and naval variants, a result of the early development of the bomber focusing on the need for the aircraft to fly at low speeds. This is partly what made the VAL such a widely used bomber from that point onwards. No longer did Japan need separate dive bombers for its army and air force, as they could now just roll VAL into any position they wished. Later, in the second half of 1942, D-3A2s would join the picture, striking their most brutal successes at the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway with the sinking of the US carriers Lexington, Yorktown, and the Hornet. In fact, the Val almost managed to knock the USA out of the war completely when dive bombers scored repeated strikes against the US's last main aircraft carrier, the Enterprise, at the Battle of the Eastern Solomons and the Battle of Santa Cruz. If that wasn't terrifying enough for the Allies in the Pacific, there was also a large land-based squadron of D-3A dive bombers based out of Guadalcanal who would often raid trade routes leading to Australia and New Guinea. Discounting the raid on Pearl Harbor and other situations where a combination of dive bombers and torpedo bombers were used, the Val sank 17 different Allied vessels in the Pacific, ranging in tonnage from an aircraft carrier to a destroyer. During the war's later years, the D-3A1 and D-3A2 would slowly be pushed out of service as both American technological advancements in the Vought F-6F Hellcat and the loss of almost all Japanese aircraft carriers in the Battle of Midway made them obsolete. If you want to find out more about those, then be sure to check out our mega projects on the F-6F Hellcat or our War at Graphics video on the Battle of Midway. Either way, obsolete or not, by the end of the war, Imperial Japan was desperate, and there was one final bloody chapter in the life of the Val the kamikaze. The Val's low speed made it an easy target for American anti-aircraft fire. Still, its heavy tonnage and easy maneuverability made it a deadly kamikaze plane on the occasions that it hit its target. In the end, so many Val's were used that only one restored D-3A exists in the Plains of Fame Museum in California. There are two more unrestored versions in the National Museum of the Pacific War in Texas. The remaining scraps are largely believed to be in great rubbish dumps or abandoned airfields dotted around the Pacific with a concentration in Papua New Guinea.
The Val had a crew of two, with one crewman being the pilot and the lead bombardier, and the second being the commander, who'd also be in primary control of the rear-mounted Type 92 machine gun. It was 10 meters long and 14 meters from wingtip to wingtip. It sat at a height of 4 meters and had an empty weight of 2,570 kilograms, making it an overall light aircraft in comparison to the American's SPD Dauntless, which was close to 3.2 tons. The Val had a maximum speed of 270 miles per hour at 6,200 meters, and a cruise speed of 184 miles per hour at 3,000 meters. It had a range of 840 miles and a service ceiling of 10,500 meters, making it slower and having a lower range than the Dauntless, but a much higher altitude, with the Dauntless being limited to 7,500 meters. As for armaments, it was generally either equipped with one 250-kilogram bomb or two 60-kilogram bombs. A frequent complaint was made that these bombs would be stored extremely close to the exterior fuel canister, which on rare occasions would lead to a spectacular fireball if struck just right by a fighter's tracer rounds or ship's AA cannons. Ultimately, the Val wasn't the fastest, nor did it have the greatest range. It certainly wasn't the best armored or armed, and it held no technological advantage up its sleeve. What it did have was a great amount of maneuverability. It taught the Americans the true value of being able to maneuver on a knife's edge, and that was what gave it its killing power. Despite the Val's numerous shortcomings, it was a deadly aircraft, and it struck fear into thousands of Allied sailors and soldiers who called the Pacific Theater their home for World War II. By the end of the war, it was obsolete, though. But what if it wasn't? In late 1945, the IGN commissioned the Yokosuka to create a sequel to the D-3A, which would primarily build off the previous design but bring it up to standard. The new plan was named the D-3Y Miyojo, which had two prototypes and three production models built. The D-3Y never saw combat as Japan's surrender came before it could be deployed, but overall it was a rather promising attempt at bringing back the terror of the Val. To the Pacific. The Miyojo was made entirely out of wood in order to preserve the vital few resources that Japan had left at the end of the war. As much as this was a clear disadvantage in regard to the aircraft's armor, it also provided a substantial boost to the Val's already impressive maneuverability, and to counter that disadvantage, it was doubtful whether the Val could have been equipped with enough armor to withstand American fighters anyway. Not only that, but the D-3Y did have a substantially improved acceleration rate when compared to the D-3A1 and D-3A2. It also enjoyed a marginally improved speed speed thanks to the new and improved 1300 horsepower Mitsubishi Kinsai engine. All of this put together made the D-3Y the perfect kamikaze aircraft. The speed would have helped it avoid American anti-aircraft fire, the maneuverability would have aided the pilot to ensure they hit their target, and whereas a metal aircraft could shatter if part of it was impacted heavily enough by a bullet, this was rarer with wood which was more likely to splinter. Thankfully for the USA, no D-3Y ever faced combat. The war was brought to an end with only three rolled into service, and like its D-3A1 and D-3A2 predecessor, the D-3Y was more designed to be a swarm attack aircraft than a centerpiece. The war in the Pacific roared to life with the roar of the D-3A1's engine. It was the first plane to drop bombs on American troops since World War I, and yet by the end of the war, the D-3A1 had become nothing but a mere joke. The strengths that had once made it a brutal aircraft, its numbers, maneuverability, and ease of repair, would become its Achilles heel and make it obsolete. Important lessons were learned from the D-3A, lessons which are still being taught around the world today.